Hello class. This video will provide you an overview of Unit 5, Growth and Moral Change. Unit 5 is called Better Angels as we lead up to the Civil War, one of the most important and traumatic events in American history, and I would argue one of the events that really clarifies the meaning of the American experiment. So we already know from our discussion of the hayne webster debate that the main cause of the Civil War will be the argument over the Constitution. And that argument will be between one side who thinks that the Constitution was a contract between the states and that contract has been broken over and over again as the national government's powers grow and the individual states and people in those states lose power as a result against those that see a strong collective federal government as all about the common good, which is basically Webster's argument of union now, union forever. But something happens from 1830 to 1860 that changes the conversation. And that change will be instrumental to causing the Civil War. So if we think about the causes of the war, we know on the one hand that the constitutional question sort of underlies all of it. But from the 1830s on, the growth of the country, the physical territorial growth of the country, as well as the changing attitudes about America will ultimately be one of the main factors that will lead to the war. So let's take a look at how all of this comes together to help cause America to fight against itself in the Civil War. The first thing that we need to consider is what changed? What happens from the beginning of American history to 1860 that leads this conflict to uh, cause an open war between the North and the South? And in order to do that, we need to look back and see something that happened before 1830. So let's take a look at something that happened in 1820 that will be very instructive for us as we try to consider how the growth and moral change of the country caused an irreconcilable difference between the North and the South. Back in 1820, we had a, a conflict between the Northern states and the Southern states. And that conflict all centered around adding a new state to the Union. You all know that the Louisiana Purchase Territory opened up the West, and so new states have been added. And if you look at this map, you can see all these new states that have been added to the Union uh, by 1820. So Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois. So we've added all these states. And as these states have been added, there's been a sort of tenuous balance between northern states and southern states. And what I mean by that is free states, states where there are no slaves, and slave states where slavery is legal. Now the reason that matters is because each state has a certain number of senators and congressmen. And if slave states outnumber free states, then slavery will become more of an issue. Uh, you know, pro-slavery forces will control the agenda. Whereas if the northern states, the anti-slavery states, the states where slavery is illegal, like Pennsylvania and New York and Massachusetts, if those states dominate the Senate and the House, then anti-slavery policies will become the standard. So in 1820, Missouri, that you can see like the orange state with sort of the hash marks through it, requests to be added to the Union. And it's a slave state, as you can see by the color, uh, the orange color there, as it marks the rest of the slave states. And Missouri, if it adds to the Union, would outnumber the northern states in terms of senators and congressmen. So it just so happens that at the same time, a group of citizens in what was part of Massachusetts in the territory of Maine was requesting the possibility of separating from Massachusetts to become their own state. And Obviously, those people had to get permission from the Massachusetts legislature and from Congress as is required in the Article 4 of the Constitution. And that agreement is basically made in order to keep the balance between slave and free states. So in 1820, Missouri comes in as a slave state and Maine comes in as a free state and that temporary balance is continued. And I guess the thing we have to consider is what happens from 1820 to 1860 that throws that balance out the window, that makes compromise no longer possible. So let's take a look at the factors that played into that. And the first and most important factor 
will be a sense of moral change that's going to sweep across the country. And it's known historically as the Second Great Awakening. The First Great Awakening would have happened back during the Puritan times. But the Second Great Awakening is a return to religious principles, a return to morality and ethics and uh, doing what's right for people, and a sense of what is the responsibility of each individual person. And so this idea of individualism and responsibility and how each person can be the best person they can be, but also do things that are moral and just, this is going to sweep the country. And these changes are going to have a profound effect on politics, on religion, on education, on medicine. Uh, it's going to really change the way people see their role in society. And if we look just at the way these revivals spread across the country, you can see, looking at this map, you can see how there's this westward movement of these religious ideas, of these moral ideas. So if you think about ministers in these towns, traveling from town to town and sort of encouraging moral and just behavior, you really get a good sense of, of what's happening in the 1830s in the, you know, in the American growth and, and moral change. So when we talk about this moral change, what, what are we talking about? So first of all, you have what becomes known as the first really American philosophy. And this American philosophy becomes known as transcendentalism. A group of authors in the early 1800s begin writing poetry and literature uh, and journals about how we can overcome sort of the mundane day-to-day -day life and transcend sort of our normal lives to find some kind of higher principle. And oftentimes that related to nature, but ultimately transcending your mundane day-to-day -day life allowed you to sort of look at the world in a new way. And the biggest proponent of transcendentalism was a man named Ralph Waldo Emerson. And you can see in this quote from Emerson sort of a, a, an idea of what it is that he's advocating. This idea of believing in your own thoughts, believing in what is true, in your heart is also true for all men that that sort of you know what it means to be a good person and you should follow that and you should listen to that voice that's in, that's in your head uh, another author who will become key and instrumental in this conversation will be Henry David Thoreau and Thoreau will very much be wrapped up in abolition like arguing against slavery about women's rights about nature uh, just uh, about what's what's the best kind of government uh, and Thoreau will famously, you know, isolate himself, go off to the woods, to a small cabin uh, in Massachusetts at Walden Pond, and ask himself, um, you know, what is a good life? What does it mean to live a life that has, that has meaning? Um, and he will, you know, basically be famous for saying something to the effect that, um, you know, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Uh, and Thoreau becomes very famous for his, for his writings uh, about Walden Pond uh, and his trips into the wilderness where he sort of communes with nature um, and very much will argue for civil disobedience and sort of doing or pushing the government to do what is right. So you can see how this transcendental movement becomes sort of an American philosophy um, right around the time when you're going to sort of start questioning women's rights and slavery and other things that have been part of the American experiment up to that time. So transcendentalism will be very important to this question. And it's going to push uh, this idea of social reform. So across the country you're going to have people start to come forward to say, wait a minute, the things that we're doing um, and the way in which we're, we're ignoring the poorest people in our society is wrong and as Americans we should do something about that. So you're going to have people like Dorothea Dix who will advocate for mental health reform. Um, she will push for hospitals to have standard procedures and for people that have mental illnesses, rather than be shunned and ignored and sort of um, abandoned by society, to be put in hospitals and mental hospitals so they can be helped and supported. Um, you also have a reform in education um, where you have no, up, up to this point, no real standard education that exists in America, but now you're gonna have reformers like Noah Webster and Horace Mann, who are going to argue that we need a standard curriculum so that all kids that go through school should have the opportunity to learn similar things. And that more importantly, that everyone, no matter their wealth or background, should have an opportunity to go to school, both boys and girls. 
So education, he argued, was a great equalizer of, of men. And this education movement is going to push more and more people to sort of know about what's going on, to learn about things, and then push for reforms. So you can see how religious reform, you know, philosophical reform with transcendentalism, and social reforms with education are going to collectively change people's attitudes because more and more people are going to know about what's right and what's wrong, and they're going to know to advocate for it. So these social reforms are going to be very important. And then ultimately you're going to start to have a push to make changes for people that are, have been left behind. And so the women's movement is going to grow largely out of this, this concept. So the women's movement will begin as a result of, of this and how um, the, the idea behind these reforms is going to transform the role that people have in society. And a woman named Elizabeth Cady Stanton, along with Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott, will begin to organize and argue that you know women should have an equal role or an equal say in uh, American society. And so they, they begin to advocate for the women's right to vote, uh, the women's suffrage movement. Um, and they even organize a convention of women at Seneca Falls, New York, where they're going to actually write their own Declaration of Independence, a declaration that basically declares that women's rights are human rights. Uh, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton will be the leader of this movement um, and basically will argue you know, that women's discontent increases you know, in the exact proportion to her, her development as a person. So as women you know, grow up and become young girls and then become young women, they realize more and more how much society leaves them behind and um, does not give them a voice. So these women begin to advocate for not just not just equality for women, but women's right to vote and be treated uh, as equals under the law. And they're going to push for this. They're not going to be successful right away, but it's the beginning of this women's movement. And of course, the biggest change that will occur in terms of people's attitudes will come around the issue of slavery and how it affects American society. You know that we've talked about slavery in the past as being uh, an essential part of the American experiment, that America wouldn't have succeeded at the beginning without slavery. Um, but it's also important to remember that even Thomas Jefferson argued early on that slavery was like a wolf that you hold by the ears. Uh, you don't like it, but you don't want to let it go. And so I think it had been so built into the Southern economy and the Southern experience, it got to the point now where the question is, how can you do without slavery? And you've got generations of slaves. And by 1830, you had two million slaves in the United States. So when you think about the population of the United States at that time, uh, you're talking about a, 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 a sizable percentage of the American population here is, is slaves. And of course, they're in the South. And you'll see in a second you know, how that breaks down. But some things happen right around the early 1800s that are going to make slavery even more important. And the most important of these will be the invention of Eli Whitney's cotton gin. You can see the image of the cotton gin here. Um, cotton is very difficult to harvest because it grows on a spindly plant with thorns and you have to sort of pick into the, the cotton to pull the, the thorns out and there's always seeds and you have to pull those seeds out by hand. But Eli Whitney's invention made cotton production more profitable because his invention separated the cotton from the seed. So you didn't need slaves to pick the seeds out of the cotton, you just needed them to pick the cotton itself. So if you think about it, one slave could now produce twice as much cotton. So it made the cotton industry that much more profitable. And so the southern economy goes from a tobacco-based economy to the early 1800s by 1830, uh, revolutionizes the cotton industry. And they're shipping cotton all over the world uh, to be made into clothing and blankets and draperies and every other thing made out of cloth. So the cotton industry is, gonna, is really going to take off. And you can see in these maps, like the widespread areas of cotton production. So this is 1820. This is previous to or prior to the cotton gin. Um, and notice the little brown dots. The little brown dots are slavery, right? So one dot equals about 200 slaves. And you can see the vast majority of slaves were in the Virginia Tidewater area, which would have been tobacco plantations, and a central part of Kentucky, central parts of Tennessee, and basically along the coast of the Carolinas and Georgia, which would have been rice plantations. 
Um, but now, as cotton is going to grow, and, and look what happens from 1820 to 1860, look at the light green area, that's areas of cotton production. By the time you get to 1860, look how much the cotton gin had revolutionized the cotton industry. And obviously, look what happens to slavery. It expands widely into Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Tennessee, Arkansas. So it's spreading all across the South. And now you've got cotton plantations all through the Carolinas and Virginia, sort of taken over. Um, so now it's tobacco and cotton, but primarily cotton. And so look how many more slaves there are by 1860 as a result of the, of the cotton industry. So if we look at the southern population in 1860, we get a good sense of it. So, you know, 66% of the southern population was white, 32% was uh, in slavery, so uh, African Americans enslaved. But look at the slave owner percentage. Only 25% of the southern population owned slaves, and that's because those were the wealthier plantation owners, uh, whereas the vast majority of southern whites were poor and either lived in cities or worked on plantations and were paid but were not uh, were not slave owners. So, and the vast majority of slave owners in the South really only had one to nine slaves. It was really the really wealthiest people who had 50 or more slaves. Uh, you know, those would have been the equivalent of modern day millionaires um, with the, the slave economy. So when you think about the breakdown, you can see how slavery spread and how it, it distributed the wealth uh, in the South. It really, um, you know, kept the rich rich um, and it was a very profitable industry having slaves. So. Out of this reform, out of these reforms, you're going to start to have people question the morality of slavery. Now, there had always been people who questioned the morality of slavery. Back in the colonial times, the Quakers, for example, the pacifist religion that largely settled around Pennsylvania and New Jersey, New Jersey, they had always been against slavery. But now you're going to start to have more because of this religious push and this reform push and this education push. People starting to say, slavery is just wrong and it needs to, to stop. And so the abolition movement will be the result of this. And the abolition movement will really get its start officially, you know, connected to the women's movement, interestingly, but also from a newspaper known as The Liberator. It was a northern newspaper. It was published by a man named William Lloyd Garrison. And Garrison's newspaper uh, essentially was just like any other newspaper, you know, like the New York Times or the Boston Globe um, or the Washington Post, but it would print articles primarily from the perspective of an anti-slavery political argument. And so the Liberator becomes more and more popular uh, around the northern states, you know, among those who believed that slavery was immoral and unjust, and these newspapers help reinforce that. So more and more people are now reading about um, these ideas of, of abolition. And then when you add to that, you know, some very outspoken and leaders in the in the abolition movement, African American leaders, people like Frederick Douglass, who was a, a former slave, um, who was self-educated, um, gave eloquent speeches around the country, um, advocating, you know, and arguing that slavery was was wrong and immoral and unjust. And there were people who who legitimately felt that Frederick Douglass was not really African American. That somehow it was a trick uh, because of the fact that he was so articulate, so well-spoken, so well-educated, such a great orator, uh, very similar to Daniel Webster in his oratorical skill, making great speeches and convincing people. And so when you have these newspapers and you have these public speakers and you have you know, African-American leaders who are symbols of, of what African-Americans can do and uh, how education can transform a person, um, that ultimately it will change people's opinions. And you're also going to have slave rebellions that happen across the South. If you came to see Birth of a Nation when we had that for a plus point film, or you just know about Turner's Rebellion, uh, a very brutal rebellion in Virginia um, where Turner leads a, a group of slaves against white families and over 60 white plantations are affected. Um, and th the slave rebellions begin to you know, terrify people in the South that slaves are going to rise up and kill them in their beds. Um, and so, you know, these massacres are going to have an effect. So when you think on these moral changes and these, these ideas of how morality is changing, you can see how attitudes are beginning to change. And so I hope you understand that this moral change, that these, these changes that are happening as a result of reform and education and religious belief, uh, they're going to have an impact on, on society from 1830 to 1860. But I think it's important that we now take a look at some of the sort of territorial reasons for change. And that's the growth of the, of the country 
both economically and geographically. So when we think about the country from 1830 on, the country is growing rapidly geographically. After the Louisiana Purchase and after Lewis and Clark go on their expedition out west and sort of map the territory, we now have more of an understanding of what land is out there, what's available for uh, the American people to, to grow and to move and to expand. And so the country is going to become um, developed in terms of its growth and that's going to be basically because of railroads and canals and, and roads that will be built between states. And so if you look at this map, you can see you know, some of these roads and canals. These canals are going to make it easy for us to transport large amounts of products from one place to another and particularly to ports that they can then be shipped out to other places. So ports like Philadelphia and New York City. Uh, Boston and you can see how you know canals and roads are going to lead to these major places where we can then ship products to other places easily and the canals will allow you to you know have barges that will take things all the way from say Pittsburgh to Philadelphia or all the way from Buffalo to New York City so so for example take a look at, at Buffalo New York you can see it there right on the shore of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario and basically the the American system develops as, as a large part by these canals that are dug. And look at the, the canal that is dug all the way from Buffalo, all the way to the Hudson River, and then eventually out to New York City. So that gives you water access from New York City all the way to Lake Erie. And that's the Erie Canal. So these canals, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in modern terms, are spent on digging these canals in order to allow access to other markets and that's going to lead to more cities and development of people living along those canals and, and waterways. Similarly, you're going, to, you're going to develop roads. Take a look at these yellow lines um, that indicate sort of roads that are developed, uh, national roads that are built um, literally from city to city, allow people to travel to the west a little more efficiently. And these roads are sort of packed down rock, so they're almost like the equivalent today of what our paved highways would be. Um, and these roads and canals and, and, and ultimately railroads are all paid for by the national government. So the national government is helping fund these infrastructure projects to sort of unite the country. And if you think about it, what better example do we have of the greater good, right? We're taking tax money from every state and we're using it to build roads and canals and, and railroads to connect states. But obviously when you connect the states a little bit more efficiently, you're going to allow people to move around a lot more. And you're also going to, in some ways, draw conflict because as you connect more closely with other places, differences of opinion are going to rise as a result of those connections. In addition to that, we begin to change the way that we organize industry in America in the 1830s. So basically, if you were making clothing in the 1830s or before the 1830s, let's say the late 1700s, you were making clothing, you basically hired people to work in your home to make those clothes and you would sell them to other people. That's just the way it worked. But now in the 1820s and 30s, you begin to have these sort of wise businessmen, wise capitalists who are gonna to come together and say, wait a minute, we can make a factory where we can actually mass produce these products and we can have all the workers come to work in our factory instead of working in these individual homes. And so places like Lowell, Massachusetts, Lewiston, Maine, uh, other parts of, of New York and, and around New York City, around Philadelphia, you're going to have these giant factories open with giant machines that will do the work and people will come and sometimes little children will work in these, in these factories. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting that connects these two things, the Lowell Mills in, in Lowell, Massachusetts will actually hire all kinds of young single women who will come and live in dormitories, work in these factories, and it's going to change their view of what women can do. They're no longer just working in their home under their father or mother. They're now independent and they're going to start be, you know, they're going to start to demand to being treated more equally and independently. So you can see how the economic growth has an impact on the moral or sort of reform movement that's happening at the same time. But we're also moving west at this time. So the country's growing geographically and people are beginning to move west and settle in these western territories. And one of the conflicts that will happen during this time uh, is the issue related to Texas because Texas was originally Mexican territory. It was owned and controlled by the Spanish and eventually when the Spanish were overthrown by the Mexican people, it was owned by Mexico. But Texas is very 
closely connected and it's continentally connected geographically to, to the United States. And so you had all these people from the United States, particularly from Tennessee, moving into this territory that technically belonged to Mexico. And eventually those American settlers that settle in Texas will rebel against the Mexican government and you've all heard of the Alamo before, the, the great massacre where the Mexican troops killed all of these Americans that were holed up inside the Spanish mission at the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas. And it becomes a rallying cry basically for Texas, remember the Alamo, uh, and these rebels, these American rebels will eventually rise up and overthrow the Mexican government and create their own independent country, the Lone Star State. Uh, will be the Republic of Texas. And for about 10 years, Texas will exist as an independent country filled with Americans. Um, eventually, those Americans will request uh, statehood and Texas will be added to the Union. So you can see how this growth, um, you know, these people spreading west, Americans are sort of spreading into these territories and taking them, uh, in some cases, by force. In addition to that, we have people moving west in this idea of manifest destiny. This picture you can see of this woman sort of moving west, you can see the wagon trains and people on horses. It becomes this idea that America is destined to control the continent, that it's our manifest destiny to control this continent from sea to sea, from Atlantic to Pacific. And you begin to have people moving west on this trail, and you've all heard of the Oregon Trail before. And one of the things that fuels that westward push is when gold is found in uh, in California in 1849. You all know about the San Francisco 49ers uh, football team. They're they're named after the fact that gold was discovered near San Francisco in 1849, and so people rushed to the West. You know there was wealth to be had in California, and California grew rapidly. And again, California was owned and controlled by Mexico. And now you've got all these Americans coming, and almost the same thing that happened. Uh, in, in Texas will happen in California. The Americans will outnumber the Mexicans and eventually they will claim the territory for themselves. And we'll get to that in a second. But this manifest destiny is going to be mostly embodied in what happens in the 1850s with the Mexican War. And we have a president of the United States, James K. Polk, who will come into office and he will see himself as the manifest destiny president. He sees himself as the man who will really make the country uh, this destined sea to, sh to, to shining sea uh, power. And so he's going to do what he can to sort of make sure that that happens. And one of the things he's going to do is he's going to provoke a conflict with the Spanish or Mexican government in Mexico in order to claim that territory. So he provokes a conflict on the Mexican border between Texas and, and Mexico. And when he does provoke that conflict, he'll use that as an excuse for America to declare war on Mexico with the idea that we will then take the remaining Mexican territory. So if you take a look at this map, you can see the pink areas are all states by the 1850s. But notice these orange areas, the ones Oregon Territory, unorganized territory, and Minnesota Territory were all owned by the United States. But the Mexican territory, which would include states, you know, parts of Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, California, um, you know, Idaho, you can see those sort of southwestern states that exist on the American map today were all owned by Mexico. And so by provoking a conflict with the Mexicans, Polk was able to fight a war and pursue his expansionist goals. And you can see on this map, you know, the U.S. kind of invades Mexico, attacks Mexico. Uh, several battles will happen in, in Mexico, a couple in, in what will be modern day California. But the majority of these battles will take place in Mexico. And so we sort of take the battle to the Mexicans with the idea that when we beat them, we will take the territories we want, which is exactly what we do in sort of taking this new territory, which will become the states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, Idaho, Utah, those southwestern states we know today. But this expanded geography is going to lead us back to that initial question, which is how do you now balance the slavery issue? As the country has grown, how do we keep a balance between slave and free states? And the real question will come, can that Missouri Compromise that we made back in 1820, can that Missouri Compromise still work all these years later? And the answer to that question is going to be no, that that compromise can't still work. 
And you should understand why now, because as the country has grown physically, and the question of how do we balance the slave versus non-slave issue, or the slave versus free issue, we can no longer compromise over slavery because the moral change, the religious change, the educational change that's happened in America from 1830 to 1860 means you can't compromise on a right or wrong anymore. If slavery is wrong, if it's immoral, if it's unjust, you can't make a political deal about it. And that ultimately will be the cause of the Civil War. So I hope this has been helpful and we'll talk more about it in class.